Absolutely. It's hot, I would say. Welcome to the 81st Annual Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Symposium on Quantitative Biology. This year's topic is on targeting cancer, and my name is Paula Kaburstis. I'm a senior editor at Science Magazine, and I'm sitting here with Dr. David Leiden of Cornell, Cornell University Medical School. Um, David's expertise is metastasis, which is a process by which primary tumor cells journey to a distant site and start growing. And um, we're interested in metastasis because it, most cancer patients die of metastasis. And the idea is if we understand how it happens, we might be able to pre pre prevent it or treat it. So, um, Dave, why don't you give us a little bit of background on how you got into the field? Okay, great. Everything I do in my lab has a lot of translation. So that means it starts with the patient. Mm -hmm. And then I bring it back to the laboratory or the bench. So I'm a pediatric oncologist by training at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center where I also work. Mm -hmm. And so children, although the cancer rate is very low compared to adults, so like 10% of all cancers are children, less than 18. But what's really significant in the pediatric population is that metastases is very highly noted in all the pediatric cancers and they have a short latency period that means that when they're diagnosed if you don't treat the patient right away they'll develop metastases very quickly and this is in strike contrast to some adult cancers like colon cancer prostate cancer where the metastases takes years to develop. So as a pediatric oncologist and very few people in pediatrics are studying metastases, I thought it would be a golden opportunity for me to understand the whole metastatic process, the evolution of metastases by using my patients and as examples and testing some of the pediatric cancers in the laboratory. Mm -hmm. So that's how I started. Um, one of the most fascinating things about metastasis is that um, it doesn't seem to be a random process. There are certain tumors that um, prefer to metastasize to certain sites, like prostate cancer um, will metastasize to um, bone and liver, whereas pancreatic cancer will never metastasize to bone. And um, this observation was made over a hundred years ago. Um, and uh, that's something you're very much interested in. And you've recently made some very provocative observations about that. And um, I wondered, um, and one of the central players is a little membrane um, vesicle called an exosome. So could you tell us about that? Sure. So I've always been interested in one of the biggest mysteries in cancer, as you say, why does cancer spread to certain organ sites? And um, it was proposed by a physician named Stephen Padgett, as you say, 100 years ago. And it's been a long-held mystery in the field. And so pediatric cancers, adult cancers, they all go to certain organ sites. And um, much of the process was thought to be all based on the tumor cell dictating all the steps. Mm -hmm. So the tumor cell leaves the main tumor, the primary tumor, enters the bloodstream and then exits the bloodstream and then kind of dictates its future site. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that seemed too simplified for me. Yeah. And, you know, cancer is clearly a systemic disease. If you see a cancer patient who's newly diagnosed, there's a lot of things going on. They could have clotting, they could have loss of muscle, which we call cachexia. So there's a lot of systemic problems. So how does the cancer communicate with the body? Mm -hmm. And so originally I thought, well, it's, it's just growth factors. We call it soluble factors. Mm -hmm. But when we study early metastases in our lab, we notice at these future sites of metastases that we call the pre-metastatic niche. So even before the tumor gets there, there's changes taking place at these organs. Mm -hmm making them fav favorable sites of metastases. What sorts of changes? Yes, so what we noticed is that 
there was bone marrow stem cells clustering in the lung. And then we noticed there's something called extracellular matrix, like scar tissue when you get collagen mm -hmm. deposits. And together they were forming this little microenvironment. And we noticed that's the exact site where tumor cells were landing, like a landing pad. Mm -hmm. But when we studied this site very carefully and detailed, and we call it electron microscopy, is where we found these bubble-like bodies <laughs> the size of viruses. Mm -hmm. So you can't even look under a regular microscope, you need an electron microscope to see them. Mm -hmm. And they were labeled with the same color the original tumor contained. Mm -hmm. So we clearly knew they were tumor-derived vesicles mm -hmm. that are now known as exosomes. So exosomes simply means exiting a body from the tumor cell. Okay. And um, what's inside exosomes, do you know? Yeah, so pretty much like what we see in cells can be packaged in the exosome. So there actually is DNA packaged in the exosome, RNA and proteins that we see. So you can imagine if you have tumor proteins, RNA and DNA packaged, and you're secreting millions of exosomes in your bloodstream, if they're able to fuse with your normal cells at distant sites, right. that won't be so such a good thing, having right. tumor information passed on to your normal healthy cells. Right. So there's a specificity there, yeah. Yes, yes. About how the um, vesicle finds its way to the organ. There's something on the outside or within the membrane that helps it. Um, get to the right place? Yes, so our lab was one of the first labs to do a protein characterization of mm -hmm. the proteins called adhesion molecules, basically sticking outside like in like antennae mm -hmm. from the exosome. Mm -hmm. And we found a protein family called integrins and there's 24 members and depending on which member you have, can dictate what organ and what cells in the organ that the exosomes are gonna fuse with. Okay. So we found different integrins explaining why some tumor exosomes are going to the liver mm -hmm. versus the lung versus the brain. Mm -hmm. And we think this is a start of explaining the mystery why cancer spreads to certain organs. Okay. Noticed in one of your papers, um, you pointed out that um, MET, which is um, a tyrosine kinase, uh, is yes. was um, within the ves vesicle. So, what is, how does that help the tumor cell grow? Do you, have you figured that out, or is that a future? Yes. Project? So, um, the MET oncoprotein is actually a byproduct of an oncogene. Oh. So we have to, you know, we can imagine if t cancer cells have oncogenes they have onco, the protein products, yep. and they're getting packaged in the exosome. And so a lot of those oncoproteins obviously are not found in normal cells. Yeah. And so CMED oncoprotein in itself, never mind the gene, can promote blood vessel development, growth, migration, uh -huh. and that's exactly what we saw when that protein called MED was transferred, say, into your bone marrow cells, we saw migration and survival properties that were brought to this pre-metastatic microenvironment supporting mm -hmm. metastases. Mm -hmm. So basically, it can help transform normal cells at distant sites. I see. Um, is the communication two ways or, um, or is it unidirectional? From That's the a really good question. So there's quite a few other labs, not particularly my lab, mm -hmm. who are studying the, the exosomes um, in different cell types, like do you have immune cells in your body, you have uh, blood vessel cells in your body, and they can also secrete exosomes. Uh -huh. And they can be either normal or in the cancer environment, they can actually give abnormal information back to the tumor and make the tumor even grow faster. Uh -huh. So um, I think it's like a busy highway here. Yeah. We have tumor exosomes going in one direction yeah. and then all your body's exosomes going back to the tumor. Right. So um, it's actually very complex and yeah. busier than we thought. Yeah. Um, 
So what about um, clinical applications? Um, where, where do you see the future um, for di de early detection, perhaps, or for actually using this information to develop a therapy? Where do you see, um, where do you hope to be in five years with this, I guess? I think there's a lot of potential for studying exosomes and helping one, especially the clinician, and determining the clinical outcome of a patient. Yeah. So let me give you an example. If you have colon cancer and you have a CAT scan of your liver and there's no metastases in the liver, the surgeon will take out the primary tumor. But we know that 20% of these patients will develop liver mets in the future. And basically, everyone who has the surgery is sent home. And when those 20% of the patients develop liver mets, they then go on to the oncologist who will start an aggressive therapy. Mm -hmm. But can we do a better job? Can we really like, help predict which patients are in trouble right from the beginning? So you can initiate yeah. advancing therapeutics Right. from an early start yeah. and prevent metastases. So we're hoping right now um, we could take a blood test and in the blood the exosomes are found in the liquid portion mm -hmm. which is called plasma mm -hmm. and we just do a spinning uh, technique where we spin down and collect the exosomes. Mm -hmm. We have our complexity because we have normal exosomes in your body. Oh. They're mostly from your bone marrow cells but the tumor exosomes are very distinct. Okay. So if we could recognize them right. and see some of the, the signatures inside, and some of the signatures are more supportive mm -hmm. of metastases, maybe we can make a big impact how we treat our patients. So maybe some of these integrins that you mentioned might be like a part of that story, if, if, if you can yes. figure out which ones are, are cancer specific or something. For yeah. sure, yeah. I'm very confident to yeah. say if tumor exosomes are missing integrins, they're unlikely to fuse okay. with okay. organs. Okay. But we notice the more integrins that you have expressed on the exosomes, the more ability they can stick to multiple organs. Mm -hmm. And so it's not that uncommon to see a lung cancer patient who might have metastases to 10 different organs we could find up to 15 different integrins uh -huh. expressed on that patient. Mm -hmm. Really saying the more integrins you have, it really equals a bad prognosis. Right. Um, okay, well that, that's really fascinating stuff. Thank you very much for talking with us. You're welcome.